Lord. Finally, thank you to the citizens of vaudreuil soulanges for your confidence in me. Working on your behalf has been a great honor for me. Together, let's continue to build an even stronger vaudreuil soulanges Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A member for Kildonan St. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 100 years ago, the Winnipeg General Strike was the largest labour action ever seen, lasting six weeks as thousands walked off the job, demanding better working conditions. 30,000 civilians left their jobs on May 15th, including veterans who six months earlier had fought in World War I. First, were, first out were the 500 telephone operators known as the Hello Girls. A courageous young woman named Helen Armstrong played a big role in the movement. She held soup kitchens for strikers and their families, wow. free for women. Her involvement was in it, that she was imprisoned three times and called a female Bolshevik. In commemoration, we held a soup kitchen in the Ukrainian Labour Temple to honour the strong women and men who took part in fighting for workers' rights. It is because of these courageous strikers that the next Prime Minister, a Liberal, brought in major Labour reforms. One hundred years later, I'm proud to stand here today to celebrate what they've achieved for women and Canadian workers across the nation. The Honourable Member for Levy Lepinier, Mr. Speaker, the government's environment plan is an unprecedented failure. The Prime Minister claims he has a plan to address climate change and that this carbon tax will allow him to meet the Paris targets. But his own government's n numbers show that this isn't true. The parliamentary budget officer has confirmed that the Liberal carbon tax will have to be set at $102 per tonne in every province to meet the targets. Think about it, Mr. Speaker. Five times more carbon tax than today. This means paying more for groceries, shipped goods, home heating, and 23 cents more per litre of gas. On October 21st, Canadians will choose an environment plan that is more credible, rational, and doable for the benefit of all Canadians. They will choose the Conservative Party. The Honourable Member for Laurentide de Laval, Mr. Speaker, after years um, of dealing with various political parties whose only goal is to show that the federal government doesn't work, we can see that uh, Laurentide has an unequaled partner in the federal government. Out of 43 municipalities, half of them have benefited from almost uh, comprehensive high-speed internet service. Poverty and unemployment are, uh, on, are going down. Families have more opportunities and more uh, chances to remain in their region. The federal government is a real partner for our region, for, and that is clear to me. Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, the citizens of Cumberland, B.C. are taking forest and watershed protection into their own hands, buying up lands from forest companies under the leadership of the Cumberland Community Forest Society. This small community of less than 4,000 has already purchased over 275 acres and raised over $3 million to protect their forests for future generations. The whole community gets involved, from plant sales and trail runs to trivia nights and local arts events. But the state are getting higher. Climate change is impacting the Comox Lake watershed, and protection is increasingly critical to the whole Comox Valley. The Cumberland Community Forest Society is working hard to buy an entire creek system, Perseverance Creek, for $2.6 million. The people of Cumberland are leading, and all levels of government need to follow. Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Insist on making life more expensive for Canadians from coast to coast. The PBO just confirmed that the carbon tax will need to be $102 per ton in order to reach the Paris Court agreements. Now that's five times 
times what the current carbon tax costs. Wow. This will increase the cost of groceries, the cost of home heating, and it'll increase the cost of gasoline by 23 cents per litre. Mr. Speaker, Canadians cannot afford this. The Prime Minister makes a false claim that this is an environmental plan, but it has nothing to do with the environment. It has everything to do with lining his pockets. Now, if it truly was an environmental plan, then he would go after the biggest emitters, but they get let off the hook. Meanwhile, soccer moms are left paying the bill. British Columbia has the longest standing carbon tax. We see the amounts of emission actually going up rather than coming down. The carbon tax, it won't reduce pollution, but it certainly will cost Canadians a whole lot of money. Now, it's time for a real environmental plan, and that environmental plan is on this side of the House. It'll be announced on June 19th. Mr. Speaker, we look forward to bringing that... Member for Spadina, Fort York. Mr. Speaker, bounce, 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 game. <laughs> there were so many memorable moments as the Raptors won the historic championship they captured last week. And the riding that I represent is quite literally today the absolute guaranteed center of the universe. As millions of Toronto sports fans across the country are celebrating. The city is celebrating the t a team that means the world to us, but it's also a team that we can see the world in. And this is critical about this beautiful team that won. The six is sweet. Our city is not only where we have the best come to play, it's also a city where the best come to live, to love, to work, to learn, and to invest. The last names say it all, from Lynn to Gasol, from Siakam to Leonard, to Nurse, to McGlure, to Masai, and of course, Aubrey and Bathia and Lowry with those two beautiful kids. Spicy P summed it up best when he said, what, no French question? Toronto's team is an international team because all the world has a home in T.O. It's the Canadian way. Nous sommes de North, we the North, we won it all. Questions, Oral, the Honourable Opposition House Leader. When it comes to pipelines, four years have proven that no matter what side of the issue you're on, nobody can trust the Liberals. We fully expect them to approve Trans Mountain later this week, just so they can say that they did. And then we fully expect them to do absolutely nothing to get it built, because they don't want to upset those voters in Burnaby. So why won't the Liberals just admit that they don't want pipelines and that Trans, Trans Mountain will never actually get built under their watch? Minister of Natural Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, we have more confidence in uh, Canada's energy sector than being portrayed by the, uh, the members of the official opposition. The we gave approval to Enbridge Line 3, which is almost completed on the uh, Canadian side. We're working with the U.S. on Keystone XL pipeline. We are moving forward on the Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project in the right way with the meaningful consultation that has been concluded with Indigenous communities. And we have full confidence in our energy sector, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Well, opposition House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, a year ago the Prime Minister promised that construction would start on TMX, and a year later not an ounce of dirt has been moved. The Prime Minister says one thing in one part of the country, and he says something completely different in another part because just like every, on everything else, he speaks out of both sides of his mouth. The Prime Minister doesn't support pipelines and the jobs that come with them. Now, he could try to prove us wrong, so will he tell us right now when will construction on TMX start in Burnaby? Yeah. Well, Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, it is uh, quite known to Canadians that when Stephen Harper got into office in 2016, 26, so 2006, 99 percent of the oil from Alberta was sold to only a single customer, which was the United States. When he left office in 2015, Mr. Speaker, that was the case 10 years later. The 99 percent of the oil was still sold to the United States because their, uh, their, uh, their plan failed to build a single pipeline to diversify our market to non-U.S. markets. We are changing that, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, four major pipelines were built under Conservative Watch with only $1 of taxpayer money used. Over the last four years, though, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister has done everything in his power to destroy jobs in Canada's energy sectors. He's forcing through devastating bills like C-48 and the No More Pipelines Bill C-69. And right now, he is playing political games with the TMX pipeline. Will the Prime Minister finally be honest with our energy workers, workers and admit he has no intention for construction to start in Burnaby? Be honest. Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. 
Mr. Speaker, if the members of the official opposition were really serious about moving forward with the process of DMX in the right way, they would not have voted to shut down and kill that process. That shows the lack of sincerity to getting our resources to non-U.S. markets. We are doing the hard work to ensure that meaningful consultation is taking place with indigenous communities, that we are taking action on the environment and protection of the environment as Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Deputy Saint Laurent. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the Trans Mountain Pipeline is essential for the economy for all Canadians, and it's good for all of Canada. Unfortunately, when they announced it a year ago, they haven't done anything since. But they paid $4.5 billion. They sent it to Houston. And now we've got C4869 that, that run the wrong way, opposed to, to, and they're opposed to energy. Can the Liberals finally tell Canadians, set the record straight, and tell them when they, the pipeline will be built? The Minister of Natural Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, once again, Conservatives are demonstrating that they have no confidence in uh, Canada's energy sector. We are moving forward on this project. From the day one, the Federal Court of Appeal made its decision cancelling the, uh, uh, the TMX project. One of the reasons that project got a stall was because when the process of the review was started in 2013 under Stephen Harper's government, they failed to include the impact of the environment on the marine, sh uh, marine shipping on the marine environment, Mr. Speaker. Back we are changing that. We are engaging with the indigenous communities in the right way to move forward on the project that will make The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians know full well what side the Liberal Party are on. And they're showing contempt for workers in the West who are working in the energy sector. And as proof, the Prime Minister said that he wanted to see oil eliminated and uh, that the rise in gas prices uh, was uh, something he wanted to see. He insulted pipeline workers. That's the, what the Liberal Party is about. In the Conservative Party, we are in favour of the Trans Mountain project because it's good for all Canadians. Can the Liberal government uh, achieve the same results? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, their actions do not demonstrate their commitment okay. to this project. If they were really committed to getting this project right, then they would not have voted down on a, pro on a process that we put in place for a meaningful consultation with indigenous communities to ensure that the impact of marine shipping was properly assessed on the marine environment, something that was excluded under Stephen Harper when that review took place, Mr. Speaker. We are changing that broken system. Honourable Member for New Westminster Burnaby. Tomorrow, Liberals are planning to announce their rubber stamp approval on Trans Mountain after pouring $5 billion of taxpayers' money into it. The project will need at least another $10 billion from taxpayers, and former Liberal Minister David Anderson and so many others say that this project has no business case. The project's not in the interest of our coast, Indigenous communities, our planet, or everyday Canadians. It is in the interest of shareholders of big oil and gas companies. So instead of another rubber stamp approval, why don't Liberals side with Canadians tomorrow and cancel the Trans Mountain Expansion Project? Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, on the one hand, you have Conservatives, they don't get the environment. On the other hand, you have the NDP, they don't get the economy. We are moving forward, building a strong economy, creating jobs for the middle class, at the same time taking action on climate, climate ensuring that we're putting a price on pollution, ensuring that we are taking action by phasing out coal, also looking after, making sure that we're meaningfully engaging with the indigenous communities. Right on. The Honourable Member for Sherbrooke. It's a former Liberal minister who's saying there's no business case for this project. Right, yeah. So people are right in being disappointed in the Liberal government. Even a former Liberal minister can't believe that the Liberals are going to approve Trans Mountain tomorrow. His concerns aren't about the environment or Indigenous peoples. They're about the vi economic viability of the project. In his view, going ahead with the project makes no sense. If the Liberals uh, aren't listening to people living on our shores or the many young people who are demonstrating on the streets, will they at least listen to a former Liberal minister and cancel this project once and for all? Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. 
we understand the diversity of opinion among indigenous communities on this project. We know that some do support this project, some do not support this project. It is our responsibility to engage with all of them, mm -hmm. to listen to their concerns and offer accommodations where accommodations are possible. Also, Mr. Speaker, we are taking unprecedented uh, action protecting our coastal communities as well through the, uh, the ambitious uh, oceans protection plan that we have put in place. That's right. Billion dollars. The Honourable Member for Sherbrooke. Mr. Speaker, what we can see is that they continue to put the interests of large oil companies ahead of people. Inequality in this country has never been as big as it is now. The Liberals are boasting about cutting taxes, but the richest Canadians are the ones who have benefited. Yesterday, our leader put forth an ambitious idea to reduce this inequality to make uh, the richest Canadians pay 1 percent uh, tax on their net worth ex in excess of $20 million, and investing those billions in services that people really need. When will the Liberals make uh, the ultra-rich members of our society pay their fair share? The Honourable Minister of Finance. It's very important to have a tax system that works. We started with cuts for the middle class and we have changed uh, uh, taxes for uh, the wealthiest. What do we have now? A system which has improved to for the middle class. They have an extra $2,000 in the pockets. We will continue to improve the situation for the middle class in the future. A member for New Westminster, Burnaby. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's the folks right behind the minister that gained the most from the Liberal tax cut because you have to earn an MP salary in order to get the maximum benefit. And if you want to tackle inequalities in this country, we need to take bold action. We need to make the richest of the 1 percent of Canadians pay a 1 percent tax on their wealth above $20 million. That means we can invest in solutions that Canadians need, like pharmacare, dental care, and an affordable place to call home. When will the Liberals stop siding with the ultra-rich of our country and put everyday Canadians first for a change? Yeah. The Minister of Finance. Member opposite might not have paid attention to what we really did. It was at the 45,000 to 90,000 tax bracket that we reduced by 7%. That's right. We also put in place the Canada Child Benefit, which was means tested, which means significant benefits went to families at lower and middle income. Of course, it was means tested after $150,000 of family income. At the same time, though, we raised taxes on the top 1%. These measures together have led us to be in a very positive economic situation with the lowest rate of unemployment in history in our country. A positive situation. We're going to keep working in the future for the middle class. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, last week the Parliamentary Budget Officer confirmed that the Liberal government's plan makes no sense. The PBO proved that under their plan, the Liberals will be increasing or raising the cost of gas at the pump by 23 cents a litre because of their carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, only Liberals would think that taxing more represents an effective plan. My question to the Prime Minister is simple. Why do the Liberals still want to raise the cost of gas by 23 cents a litre at the expense of Canadians? Mr. Speaker, the question the Honourable Member put on the floor of the House of Commons is grossly misleading. He knows that the PBO report uh, presumes that no action will be taken beyond measures that are currently in place in order to hit our targets. We will hit our targets. To date, we have put forward a price on pollution. We are going to make sure that 90 percent of our electricity comes from non-emitting resources from 2030. We've made the largest investment in the history of public transit. Mr. Speaker, I have taken hundreds of questions in this chamber, not one of them from Conservative MP asking us to do more. When it comes to the environment, the Conservative Party of Canada cannot be trusted. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, since this Liberal government took office, Canadians' cost of living has shot up. And, oddly, so has the deficit. Eighty percent of families, Canadian families, are paying more tax since the Liberals took office. That represents $800 more per year. That's coming out of Canadians' pockets. So I'll repeat my question for the minister. Why will they, do they want to keep uh, increasing this burden for Canadians by hiking the cost of gas by 23 cents a litre? Okay. 
Mr. Speaker, with respect, when it comes to the affordability, we have no lessons to learn from the Conservatives who oppose the Canada Child Benefit, which put more money in the pockets of 9 out of 10 low- and middle-income families. They voted against cutting taxes for middle-class Canadians and voted for keeping them low for the one richest 1%. When it comes to climate, Mr. Speaker, I've answered so many questions. They don't seem to listen. They won't listen to Conservative stalwarts like Preston Manning. They won't listen to the Nobel Prize winner in economics. I'd urge them to listen to the Pope from this past weekend, who said for too long we've collectively failed to listen to the fruits of scientific analysis and called carbon pricing essential. It's time to get with the program. The Honourable Member for Richmond Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, it's clear Liberals cut tax credits for people using public transit. The Liberals cut tax credits for children participating in sports and cultural activities. And the Prime Minister created a deficit on the backs of our children and grandchildren who will have to pay it one of these days. In the end, Canadians are the ones paying. Canadian workers will be paying more tax because of this government. Why is the Prime Minister again hiking the cost of gas by 23 cents a litre with his carbon tax? Now the Parliamentary Secretary. I want to talk about adding costs for the next generations, Mr. Speaker. Inaction on climate change is the thing that is going to lead to the greatest cost for future generations. Every time we propose a measure to deal with the environment, the Conservatives oppose it. They, they oppose our price on pollution. They impose, uh, oppose our largest investment in the history of public transit. For God's sakes, Mr. Speaker, when we announced we were going to be banning harmful single-use practice uh, plastics and gave them an opportunity to support the environment or garbage, they've chosen garbage, Mr. Speaker. They cannot be trusted when it comes to the environment. It's time we get with the 21st century. Climate change is real, and we found a way to make life more affordable for families at the same time. I think the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary met, for goodness sake, he's uh, gone from the Pope to a higher power. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, speaking of the Pope, it's time that they made confession over there. Yeah, yeah. Because they've been keeping a deep, dark secret that if this government is re-elected, as the PBO has pointed out, the carbon tax will add a full 23 cents to the cost of gas. Now, this is the PBO, whose word is much more reliable than that of a government that's missing its data balance budget by two decades. So will, will the member unburden his soul and confess to Canadians the real price that he will add to a litre of gas if re-elected? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the recent PBO report, the Honourable Member knows that it presumes that no further action will be taken on climate change. I suggest the Honourable Member is projecting what we should expect to see in the Conservative plan due to come out this week. I'd also invite the Honourable Member to review the prior report of the Parliamentary Budget Officer, which indicated 8 out of 10 families in his province will be left better off as a result of our plan. We're following the advice of the leading experts in the world, including last year's winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics. Mr. Speaker, if he won't believe me, he won't he won't believe the Pope. He won't believe the Nobel Prize winner. I'd suggest there's no convincing him. Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, Mr. Speaker, you still would answer the simple question of how much gas prices will go up when the Liberal carbon tax is fully and finally implemented. But the PBO went on C CTV last week and said that the, the Liberal plan for the carbon tax would have to be twice as high as they now admit and five times as high as it now is leading to gas prices that would rise 23 cents a litre. If the PBO is wrong, then how much will gas prices go up under the Liberal plan? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Speaker, if the Honourable Member had actually read the PBO report, he would notice that he actually pointed out that this was the least expensive option. I expect that the Conservative plan will mirror that of Doug Ford's, and I'm curious that their strategy is to cozy up to the Premier of Ontario. However, we know that it's going to lead to a worse record in terms of emissions reduction and a greater cost for families. We've been transparent about our plan. The price will increase to $50 a ton by 2022. I'll show them the website afterwards. Until then, I'll assume their plan will mirror Doug Ford's and will make life more expensive for families. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Ah, so there we have it. 23 cents a litre is the minimum cost Liberals would impose on Canadian motorists. Well, I think Canadians would like to know what is the maximum cost of a Liberal carbon tax. He's right. The PBO did say that the Liberal carbon tax could actually be higher than the $100 a ton. Yeah. Speaks about provincial politics. We know that Kathleen Wynne is their model. She lied in four elections about coming tax increases. She increased the cost of energy. If she, they're following that model, why won't they come clean before the election and tell us how much it will cost and higher gas prices if the Liberals are re-elected? The Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for the opportunity to clarify because, as a Parliamentary Budgeter uh, Officer pointed out, uh, the Climate Action Incentive actually makes life more affordable for his constituents. The whole system works by returning the rebates directly to households. A typical family of four and the Honourable Member's own constituency would have received $370 off their taxes this year. I'm curious that the Conservative Party of Canada has now adopted an approach towards politics that would see families pay more tax. It comes as no surprise to me after a number of years watching them vote against the Canada Child Benefit, against the middle class tax cut, and now against the price on pollution that will reduce emissions and make life more affordable. Order. The Honourable Member for jean -Kier. Mr. Speaker, the health care system is no longer in tune with the current reality. It's not normal for care in some areas to be covered and others not, like dental and vision care. The Liberals' approach simply isn't producing the desired results. The NDP proposes to extend coverage for health care so that it covers people from head to toe, while offering Quebec and other provinces an opportunity to withdraw with compensation. Will the government use the NDP's example to extend medical coverage so that it also includes dental and vision care? La Santé. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy of our government's uh, historic investments in health. To meet the needs of Canadians of today and in the future, we have invested 11... Uh, or many millions of dollars in mental health care. We will continue to work the provinces and territories to ensure that Canadians are proud of their health care system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Elmwood, Transcona. Well, Mr. Speaker, that wasn't really an answer to the question. You know, I mean, it was over 20 years ago that the Liberals first promised Pharmacare. They've had three majority governments since then, and their common criticism of the NEP is that we're in too big a hurry. <laughs> We think it shouldn't have taken 20 years for Canadians to get affordable access. And we're not prepared to uh, apologize for that in the least, Mr. Speaker. And we also know, because the science tells us that preventive access to things like dental care and eye, eye care are less expensive in the long term and uh, improve quality of life. So will they commit today to moving forward on that? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to be a part of a government that has made historic investments in the area of mental care and home care to make sure that we can meet the needs of Canadians for today and also for tomorrow. We have invested more than $11 billion in the area of home care and mental health and from there we continue to work with provinces and territories as we want to make sure that our health care system remains a point of pride for all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. When six Premiers expressed their serious concerns about the Liberals ramming the anti-energy Bill C-69 through the House, the Prime Minister attacked them and accused them of threatening national unity. When respected economist Dr. Jack Mintz raised concerns with the damaging impact of the Liberals' energy policies, the Minister of Natural Resources attacked him and accused him of undermining Canada. Why is it, whenever legitimate concerns about the energy sector are raised with these Liberals, their response is always, Shut your mouth. Ottawa knows best. Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, Minister of Environment. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, part of our commitment in 2015 was to put forward an agenda that would help us grow the economy and protect our environment at the same time. We noticed that after 10 years of government under Stephen Harper, where they couldn't get major projects done, part of it had to do with the fact that they rammed through an environmental assessment process that did not gain the trust of Canadians. We're advancing better rules that's going to enhance public participation, strengthen environmental protections, and give certainty to industry. This is why the Mining Association of Canada is behind it, the industry that deals with these processes more than any other. Mr. Speaker, if the Honourable Member would like a, a tutor session with me, I'd be happy to walk him through it afterwards. to be judicious in their choice of words. The Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Well, Mr. Speaker, if you wanted to see Ottawa Liberal arrogance, there it was. Nine provinces have expressed their concern about Bill C-69. Indigenous leaders from across the country have expressed their concerns about Bill C-69, and this government has ignored them every step of the way because they believe when it comes to energy, they're the only ones that know anything, Mr. Speaker. How can this government get come off saying they know best when they've been the worst government in Canadian history when it comes to Canadian energy workers? The Honourable Order, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with great respect to the Honourable Member, it was the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada who said that Ottawa knows best. Exactly. We are moving forward with an agenda that's going to strengthen environmental protections, it's going to provide certainty for industry, and importantly, it's going to allow the public greater opportunities to take part in the environmental assessments of projects that impact their communities. These are simple principles, Mr. Speaker. We've went through an extensive period of consultation to understand the impact it would have on Canadians. We've come up with a process that will help grow our economy, protect our environment at the same time, and I'm proud to stand with this government as we move forward with this ambitious agenda. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals must approve the Trans Mountain expansion tomorrow, which they already did before in 2016, except now this time it actually has to get built. But the Liberals are blocking all new pipelines with their anti-energy, anti-business Bill C-69 that nine out of ten provinces in all three territories oppose. The Nishka, the Lakhalams, and hundreds of other Indigenous communities are against the Liberal shipping ban C-48, and they've been against it from day one. But instead of cancelling it, these Liberals are steamrolling opposition and Indigenous communities to force it through before summer. So will these Liberals kill these anti-energy bills before it's too late? Honourable Minister, uh, Secretary to the Minister of Transport. It remains committed to delivering on its promise to Canadians to uh, put forward this oil tanker moratorium and to formalize it in legislation. I stood in this House just this morning uh, addressing the Senate mil uh, amendments that came over. Uh, we have, are hoping to work with all parliamentarians here. Uh, I think it's important for Canadians to understand when it comes to Bill C-48, every single party in this House voted in favour it. The only party that didn't vote in favour it was the Conservatives, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Order, order. I remind members that those singing can do so outside. Now, remember for Lakeland. Well, it's ironic that that member would answer the question since he's the one from Burnaby who opposes the Trans Mountain expansion. That's right. Now, the Senate changes to the Liberals No More Pipelines Bill C-69 would actually have increased the voices of locally impacted Indigenous communities and research reviews, but the Liberals rejected them. And manufacturers, chambers, economists, provinces and municipalities are outraged too. Quebec warns, quote, C-69 gives the federal government the equivalent of a veto over Quebec economic development. And Ontario says it's the worst possible news at the worst possible time, which will, quote, hinder natural resource related economic development in Canada. So again, will the Liberals kill Bill C-69 before it's too late? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, with uh, great respect uh, to the Honourable Member, we know that the mining sector, as an example, is the sector that deals with environmental assessments more than any other industrial sector in the Canadian economy. They come out supporting the process that is outlined in Bill C-69 because they understand that we're putting forward better rules than were put forward under the previous government. We have better rules that are going to enhance environmental protection, it's going to increase the ability of the public to take part in the projects that affect them, and it's going to engage Indigenous voices at the same time that we bring certainty to industry. 
This is not complicated. This is common sense, straightforward proposals that will help improve our ability to get major projects done in the right way. Great. Member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, a man was deployed seven times as a language and cultural advisor for the Canadian mission in Afghanistan. Like many Canadians, a man brought the war home with him in the form of PTSD. When he reached out to this government, he was told he wasn't eligible because he had not applied for civilian benefits on time. Wow. Civilians share the risk, but they don't get the support? That is wrong. Yeah. Surely this government can support this gentleman in his desperate time of need and all the other civilians who put their lives on their, li their, lives on the line for Canada. Yeah. Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, we are proud of the work of the women and men in uniform and civilians who have served in Afghanistan. I want to thank Mr. Wabi for uh, his work and dedication to helping our Canadian Armed Forces members. For privacy reasons, I can't speak to the specifics of the case, but I have directed officials to look into this case and find a solution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable member for Vancouver East. Abortion is legal in Canada, yet some struggle to access this service in a timely fashion. It's not enough for the Liberals and the Conservatives to say that they won't reopen the abortion debate. Under the Canada Health Act, abortion services are insured, yet only one in six hospitals actually offer these services. Some provinces will not cover the cost of surgical abortion in health clinics. Access is even worse for people in rural areas, the North and the Atlantic provinces. Will the Liberals enforce the Canada Health Act to ensure medical and surgical abortion is available and covered in all parts of the country? Minister of Health. Harper Conservatives, we know that the abortion uh, rights are protected under the Charter of Rights and Freedom, and we will always defend those rights. We believe that all Canadian women should have access to safe abortion services, and that's why we stood up for reproductive health options in all parts of Canada, including expanding access to Mifogaimizo in different parts of the country, and including rural areas, to ensure that everyone has access to abortion services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Brossard Saint Lambert. Mr. Speaker, residents of Brossard Saint Lambert and myself were thrilled today to hear that the new Samuel de Champlain Bridge will be opening very soon. In 2015, our government said clearly that we wanted to help families have easier commutes so that they could spend more time together and less time stuck in traffic. Can my honorable colleague, the, the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities, update us on the opening of the new details concerning the new Champlain Bridge? The Honourable Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I want to thank my colleague, the member for Brossard Saint Lambert, for her support uh, and her really her tireless support throughout this project. We are proud to deliver the residents of Montreal a modern and emblematic bridge. The north end will be open starting on June 24th. The official opening ceremony will happen on June 28th and the South End will be open starting July 1st. Mr. Speaker, the true heroes of this project are the over 1,600 workers who worked tirelessly to deliver this amazing project for Canada. The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Mr. Speaker, in the past few weeks, the community of Avon B and Hundred Mile have been devastated by sawmill closures. We have an industry in crisis, and it's moving en masse to the United States. Despite this urgency, this government failed to even consider it as part of the NAFTA negotiations. The Prime Minister is heading to Washington next week to meet with a U.S. President. Will he commit? to addressing the softwood lumber dispute mm. with President Trump. Secretary to Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Uh, we strongly disagree with U.S. tariffs on software lumber. These are punitive duties. They're unfair. They're deeply troubling. Our government will take every opportunity to vigorously defend our forestry industry, its workers against protectionist trade measures. My father is a professional forester. I grew up in that industry. We are committed to it. We will continue to work constantly to ensure that our industry is successful and our workers are employed. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg-Road Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, for two years now, we've been calling on the Prime Minister to take action to manage the border crisis. For two years, he's been spending millions welcoming illegal migrants, but he's done nothing to stop migration. On Thursday, he's meeting with President Trump. 
Will he have the courage to stand up and bring up the issue of illegal migrants entering Canada from the U.S.? The Honorable Minister of Border Security. Outset, we've been very clear that our government is committed to a fair and compassionate system which does in fact provide protection to those in, who need it while ensuring the safety of all Canadians. Mr. Speaker, we've achieved an extraordinary reduction in the number of people who have been crossing our borders irregularly as a direct result of our work with the United States and our, our, our other partners right across Canada and around the world. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to work hard for Canadians to ensure that our system remains fair and safe. Honourable Member for Selkirk and Lake Eastman. Well, Mr. Speaker, Canada's Arctic sovereignty is under threat. The United States refuses to recognize our sovereignty over our Arctic waters. Last month, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called our claim to the Northwest Passage illegitimate. The Arctic has never been a priority to these Liberals, and the Prime Minister has never stood up for our Arctic sovereignty. Right. The Prime Minister is meeting with President Trump on Thursday. Now, does the Prime Minister plan to continue his policy of giving away our sovereignty and Trump, or will he finally fight for our Arctic? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, Canada's Arctic sovereignty is long-standing. It's well established. We've taken every opportunity to express that. We know that the North is an extremely important region of our country. It's more than photo ops. It's more than taking a picture and going to the Arctic once a summer. It's about real people, sustainable environmental protection, and ensuring that Canada's sovereignty is protected. We will stand firm. Canada's Arctic is Canada's Arctic. Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Speaker, when will we see the Prime Minister stand for our sovereignty. Yes, yeah, yeah. Canadians are concerned about the Prime Minister's ability to convince the U.S. President when he meets with him this week to act with Canada to free two Canadians from a Chinese prison. This Prime Minister consistently fails Canadians in our global relationships and in particular with China, to the point where the Chinese President has said he won't meet with the Prime Minister during the G20. With lives hanging in the balance, will the Prime Minister secure the support of the U.S. President to help release our imprisoned Canadians in China. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, Canadian lives do hang in the balance. And this is not about political grandstanding. It's not about rhetoric. It's about doing the work patiently and persistently and continuing to not to try to score political points, but to bring Canadians home safely. We've rallied an unprecedented number of partners around the world in support of Canada's position. NATO, Australia, the EU, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, the United States Senate. We will continue to stand up for Canadians. We ask all members of this House to do the same. Well done. The Honourable Member for Longueuil Saint Hubert. Mr. Speaker, I hope that this uh, government will finally rise above partisanship. But, you know, one year ago, rather one month ago, the NDP tabled a motion on the urgency of climate action, but the Liberals and Conservatives voted against it. Seems the government would rather adopt its own motion on climate change, one that maintains pipelines and oil subsidies. They'd rather play political games than work with other parties to deal with this emergency. Will the government stop politicizing this criti critical issue and start working with all of us to review emissions targets and oil subsidies and start the green transition? An entire generation is waiting for them to do so. Will they do it, yes or no? Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministry of Environment. Mr. Speaker, I'd be uh, honoured to work alongside the Honourable Member any day to advance a, a climate uh, agenda that actually makes sense. One of the problems with the NDP's climate motion is that they called for the immediate end to all subsidies, no matter what, which included subsidies that provide electricity to northern remote Indigenous communities. It included subsidies for research that would actually help some of our biggest polluters bring their emissions down. And it includes subsidies that's going to help with the transition towards electric vehicles. As always, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to climate change, the NDP have their heart in the right place, their head simply hasn't caught up. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Essex. As the Prime Minister goes to meet with Donald Trump in the U.S., he has shut down debate on a trade deal that will impact Canadians for generations to come. The Liberals' promise of a full debate on the new NAFTA is now just another broken promise. Yep. Cost of medication, copyright extension, corporate powers over our regulatory bodies, dairy farmers losing out, and jobs. All of these are at stake. On the TPP, the Trade Committee had over 400 witnesses on a cross-country tour. Do you know how many witnesses we'll have at the pre-study on the new NAFTA tomorrow? 12. Wow. Why are Liberals trying to silence stakeholders and keep Canadians in the dark? Yeah. 
Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This member in particular should know that the new NAFTA is a great deal for labour, for auto workers, especially those in her own riding. Yeah, yeah. Then President of Windsor Essex Regional Chamber of Commerce Janice Forsyth said, and I quote, the new deal is a great step forward. Oh. Flavio Volpe, the President of the Automotive Parts uh, Manufacturers Association of Canada, has said, Windsor is perfectly positioned to take advantage of the new agreement. Mr. Speaker, why will this member not support the workers of her own riding instead of trying to score some political points? The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. The Liberals are falling far short of their Paris targets, yet the Minister continues to pretend that she's on track, tr trying to distract from her own climate failures. Now she asks Canadians to believe that the Liberals won't hike the carbon tax past $50 per tonne. Wow. Right. <laughs> the Parliamentary Budget Officer has said that for the carbon tax to have any effect, it would need to be doubled to meet the Paris targets. The Liberals can't have it both ways. When will the Minister admit she won't meet the Paris targets? Yeah. Yeah. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, uh, with respect, we are going to meet our Paris Agreement targets because, quite frankly, failure is not an option. With respect to the PBO report, I pointed out a number of times on the floor today that it assumes that no further steps will be taken on climate change. Perhaps this is foreshadowing what the Conservative plan is going to look like. We know that climate change is real, and we know that we have an obligation and an opportunity to do something about it. In fact, I think we have an obligation to do the most effective solutions that we know exist today. That includes putting a price on pollution that's going to bring emissions down, but by working with folks like the Nobel Prize winner in economics last year. We found a way to do it that makes life more affordable for Canadian households. Honourable Member for Lévy. Mr. Speaker, can you explain to me why the Liberals are spending more than $25,000 on an organization that has been banned by the CRA due to its links to terrorist organizations? ISNA is on the blacklist of the agency. An audit found that money ostensibly meant for charity work was being sent to an extremist terrorist organization, or at least an organization considered a terrorist organization by India, the U.S., and the EU. We're talking about terrorism and extremism here. So what, why was this money approved, and what is the, ma the minister waiting for to revoke the money immediately, rather than proceeding to bogus studies? The Secretary to the Minister of Employment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the, uh, my colleague across for the question, and uh, he knows we unequivocally condemn violence, extremism of any kind, and is unacceptable and is not tolerated. Uh, we understand and, and share the members' concerns about this organization. E EDSD is conducting a review of this matter through Service Canada Ontario, and the, and the member has long served in this house. He knows how this program works. That. Uh, Money will not be flowing if, in fact, uh, these, uh, th this group is not compliant. Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill, order. The Liberals can't stand up and say that they don't support terrorism and then give funding to an organization that was proven to have given money to terrorists. It's ridiculous. Yet they made organizations that do things like support women who are single moms, uh, support poverty reductions in our community. They had th that funding rejected because these organizations wouldn't sign their others' values test. When are they going to do the right thing? This is a no-brainer and revoke the funding to this organization. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives like to say that, you know, politics are being played with the Canada summer jobs. Mr. Speaker, politics are being played by this because we know that the Conservatives have continued to mislead Canadians with regard to Canada summer jobs. They say that we're not funding any faith-based groups anymore. Even in the leaders' office, even in the leaders' uh, riding, Raymore Baptist Church has received funding. Avonhurst Pentecostal Assembly, Echo Lake Bible Camp, Mr. Speaker. I think if they check their list, that would be another aspect of, the, of, of this program that they continue to play politics with. Sure. I remind the other member for Calgary Nose Hill that after she poses her question, yeah. someone else gets to speak. So she should not be interrupting when someone else is speaking, and nor should anybody else. You should all keep that in mind that each side gets its turn. The Honourable Member from Marcoral Fortin. Mr. Speaker, over the last few years, I've had the privilege of sitting on the National Defence Committee. While our government uh, implemented its new defence policy, and our men and women in uniform 
are the priority for this government. And this includes people who, in, who participate in the reserves. Will the Minister of National Defense tell us about the recent changes implemented to support our reservists across the country? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague from Mark Orell for 10 for his question and his support to the reservists. Last week, I was in Laval to announce changes to the reserve force pay. And Mr. Speaker, uh, the reservists will now be paid the same as the regular force uh, for the valuable work that they do. This important initiative laid out in our defense policy, Strong, Secure and Engage, is a clear demonstration of how we value the dedication of all members of the Canadian Armed Forces. To our reservists, you make us proud. Merci beaucoup. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, last week the PM claimed the Liberal member for Steveston, Richmond East, addressed allegations the MP's law firm was used by a notorious Chinese drug boss to launder money. We now learn the BC inquiry into money laundering has discovered the same member was directly involved in another suspicious deal. The purported deal involved a wealthy gambler, hidden investors, and an unexplained million dollar transfer in and out of the MP's law firm. Mr. Speaker, will the PM act, or is this just another occasion? of one set of rules for Liberals and another for everyone else. The Honourable Minister of Border Security. Speaker, we, we were, we've been working very hard with the provincial governments right across the country, and in particular in British Columbia, on the issue of money laundering. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm not going to comment on any unproven allegation at this point, but I will, what I will tell you is that our government's been working very, very diligently to address all of the vulnerable, sectoral vulnerabilities, including working with law societies from across Canada to address the concerns that are being addressed. Member for Churchill, Kiwatnook, Askey. Mr. Speaker, a valley tailing stand by my community of Thompson has been flagged by outside investigators for stability concerns. Valley told its shareholders of this, but not people living on the ground. In fact, it took an investigative report from the Wall Street Journal for this to come to light. No one wants another Mount Polly disaster. But this is a company that showed repeatedly that it does not take these kinds of safety concerns seriously. So to the minister, what is this government doing to ensure the protection of the people and the environment around Thompson and in our north? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, we take the safety of communities very, very seriously, and we safety, take the safety of such. Uh, what I'll do is I will absolutely follow up with the Honourable Member to ensure that we are listening to her concerns as well as concerns of the community. Member for Vaughan Woodbridge. Mr. Speaker, the steel sector directly employs over 20,000 Canadians no. across the country and it is vital to manufacturing companies in my riding of Vaughan Woodbridge. In the face of the U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum, Canadians stood together and firm to defend these important industries and our workers. Now that we have succeeded in having the U.S. tariffs fully lifted, can the Minister of Finance update the House on how our government is working to continue to protect the industry and workers from unfair trade practices? Great question. Minister. challenges around the world, we need to continue to take actions to protect our steel industry against the potential of import surges. We introduced Bill 101 in order to make sure that we have the flexibility to stabilize our market, to protect workers, to protect the industry in the case of steel surges that might come because of those protectionist issues. So I want to thank the member from Vaughan Woodbridge and the Finance Committee for their work, and I want to ask all members in the House to, br to bring forth their unanimous support so we can move this bill forward quickly to protect steel workers and to protect our steel industry. Honourable Member, Calgary Shepherd. Nearly two million Hong, uh, people in Hong Kong have taken to the streets to protest the draconian new extradition law that would have seen residents and visitors, including Canadians, sent to China to face trial in communist-controlled courts. They are on the streets to defend their hard-earned democracy. The extradition law is a clear assault to Hong Kong's autonomy. There is mounting pressure for Hong Kong's PRC-controlled leader, Carrie Lam, to resign after trying to ram through this law and silencing peaceful protesters with violence. What action is the government taking to support the people of Hong Kong? Kong and the 300,000 Canadians living there. Speaker, I want to thank the member for his sincere question and his concern about this topic, which I think is shared throughout this House. We have expressed serious concerns about the proposed amendments to Hong Kong's extradition laws. They've been delayed. They've not yet been cancelled. 
The Hong Kong government must listen to the voices of its citizens. Last week, we issued a, another public statement expressing our concern about the impact of these changes. And we are very aware that there are indeed 300,000 Canadians living in Hong Kong. That is a special concern to all of us. I took this topic up with legislators when I met with them in Hong Kong. We will continue to advocate for human rights in our world. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, Quebec finally passed its law on state secularism. Finally, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister now commit to respecting the will of Quebecers and the will of the National Assembly? Will he promise not to challenge the law in court and not to fund a court challenge of the new Quebec law? Ministre la Justice. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, our position has always been clear. It's not for politicians to tell people what they should or should not wear. Canada is already a secular country, and that is reflected in our institutions. No one should have to choose between their religion and their job. This new law violates people's fundamental individual rights. We will always defend the Charter, Mr. Speaker, and we will do so for all citizens of Canada. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, the chair of the Justice Committee, who is totally out of touch with Quebecers, has already called it a sad day for Quebec. It took him less than 24 hours. Well, despite what he thinks, this is a great day for Quebec. It's the culmination of over 10 years of debate on Quebec secularism. But the game is not won yet. We still need to make sure that Ottawa won't challenge the law in court. Will Quebecers get a solemn promise that the federal government will respect their wishes and refrain from challenging the new secularism law either directly or indirectly. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I know the chair of the Justice Committee. I've known him for years. He's a proud Quebecer, he's a proud Canadian, and he has the right to his opinion on this very fundamental issue in Quebec. Come, come the man, Mr. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we've always defended the Charter. It is not up to the government to tell people what they should or should not wear. We already have a secular country here in Canada, and as I have already said, we will defend the Charter. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. It was one of the proudest moments of my life when I was elected to the first Legislative Assembly of Nunavut. There was such hope and promise. But fast forward 20 years and life is not better for Nunavut Mute. For many, it's worse. Nunavut only works if we can build a sustainable economy, and we can only do that with the support that was promised by the federal government. It will take massive investments in infrastructure, housing, roads, ports, and connectivity. Mr. Speaker, through you, will the Prime Minister finally work with the government of Nunavut and fulfill the commitment Canada made 20 years ago, or do we have to wait another 20? The Honourable Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. With pride that, that Canada is working with the government of Nunavut, but in all the, our northern partners to be able to develop and implement the new Arctic and northern policy framework that will be done based on the principles that were determined by northerners around infrastructure, investing in people and investing in our sovereignty. So I look forward to working and being able to announce that very quickly. Come, il est 15 8. As it is 3.08 p.m., the House will now proceed to the taking of the deferred recorded division on the motion at the third reading stage of Bill C-88. Call in the members.